Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, as we continue looking at the, the I am statements of Jesus. I'm sure you remember the, uh, the TV show, Candid Camera. Well, in, in one particular episode, the, uh, it took place at this exclusive prep school. All the students are well above average and they're getting ready to go to college. And the candid camera crew posed as career consultants. And they gave them these surveys or tests to see what area they would be particularly good at doing, you know, what profession that they should do for the rest of their lives. And the, and the students bought into it, they looked good. And so they took the surveys and then they came back later for the results and to see what jobs they should take. And one young man eagerly awaited the counselor's verdict and, and uh, <clears throat> well, he figured he would be a bank president, you know, something big, important, making lots of money. And he said, son, after evaluating your tests and interview, I've decided that the best job for you is a shepherd. And he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> I mean, who in the right mind wants to be a shepherd? Well, Jesus did. Jesus did, and he calls himself the good shepherd. In John 10, he calls himself a shepherd. But first in John chapter 10, he called himself a gate. You remember we looked at that last week, John chapter 10, verse 7. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Now, what do you think about, what do you think about when you hear the word gate? You know, I, I, I use just picture a, a, a simple chain link fence gate. Right, not much to it. Maybe, maybe you think of a, a wooden gate, uh, like on a barn or for a farm, or, or maybe you picture something fairly ornate, a little fancier. If you have uh, pets or children at home, you know you might picture a different kind of gate, or maybe you're thinking just completely out of the box, and you thought of the Golden Gate Bridge. That's a different gate, I guess. Yeah, you know, but those are not the images that would have come to mind for anyone hearing Jesus say, I am the gate for the sheep. As I mentioned last week, at the end of the day, two or more shepherds would bring their sheep together and they would put them in a pen for the night. And then somebody else would watch them during that night. A another shepherd would take care of them during the night. It would have been a wall uh, around wall and, and uh, with only one opening, uh, no door, no gate, because the shepherd was the gate. You know, the gate was his own body. And once the shepherd was, once the sheep were in, there was no way to get out except over the shepherd's body, no way to get in, you know, no way for, for anything wanting to, to take the, the sheep, wolves or whatever, except through him. And so Jesus pictures himself as our Gate. Next, Jesus pictures himself as our shepherd. In verse 11, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Of course, if Jesus is our shepherd, you know what that means. That means we are his sheep, right? We are his sheep. Uh, now, it, it's a picture that is used often in the Bible to describe God's people. Not everyone appreciates that picture, though. Not everybody wants to think of themselves as sheep because not many good things are, are said about a sheep. And so they don't want to think about themselves as being sheep. You know, what qualities do sheep have other than, well, their wool, and I guess to be eaten. And other than that, you know, there's not a lot. Several years ago, the Camden Herald in Camden, Maine, ran two photos in, on the same page. And the first picture was of Camden's town leadership and the, and the town manager. And the other picture was of a flock of sheep. And then entered Murphy's Law, right? Anything that can go wrong, 
will go wrong. And so I don't have to tell you what happened, but I will anyway. The captions for the two pictures were accidentally, according to the editor, accidentally reversed. And so under the, uh, under the sheep, right, was the caption, uh, you know, of the town's officials and their names. And then under the photo of the sheep was the sheepfold. Naive and vulnerable, they huddle for security against the uncertainties of the outside world. <laughs> and you can picture uh, all the town leaders with that caption below their, their picture. I'm not sure what the town leaders thought about it. I wonder what our city council would think about it. I think they'd probably just laugh it off as being something funny. But, you know, it's not usually not a compliment to compare yourself to sheep. You know, sheep aren't, there's not much to sheep. When your children have fall, a hard time falling asleep, what do you tell them to count? Sheep, fluffy little sheep. Not wolves, venomous snakes, no fluffy little sheep. If there's a truck that wrecks and it's got, it's full of uh, wild animals, tigers and bear, what do you do? You hide in the house. But if it's, it's wrecked and it's got sheep in it, it had sheep, what do you do? Oh, let's go see them. Let's go see if we can help round them up, right? They're, they're gentle. They're not to be feared. And so some people don't like being compared to sheep, but the Bible compares us to sheep all the time. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 100 verses 3 and 4, know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture enter his gates with thanksgiving. And how does the 23rd Psalm begin? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. You know, throughout that Psalm, throughout Psalm 23, David describes himself as, you know, one of God's sheep. God is the shepherd, his staff, his rod, right? He's using those similarities, comparing us to sheep. You know, and God as a good shepherd. And so the Bible says we are sheep and we definitely need a shepherd. And so Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So let's begin John chapter 10 with verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Now, what do you think of when you picture, imagine in your mind, Jesus as being a, a good shepherd? There, there are many images that come to mind, but uh, I think chief among them is maybe this picture. Yeah, that was one of my mother's favorite pictures. You know, Jesus holding this little lamb, Jesus as our shepherd. You know, notice in verses 11 and 14, Jesus refers to him as the good shepherd. There are multiple good shepherds, shepherds, there's just one. And then in verse 16, he says there will be one flock and, and one shepherd. Jesus is the only good shepherd. 
But as we'll see in a minute, Jesus is also referred to as the chief shepherd. However, there are other shepherds. In fact, there are shepherds in the church. In his letter to to the Ephesians, Paul mentioned positions that Jesus gave the church, uh, leaders to help a congregation. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11, says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the un reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. He says, Jesus gave apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the word pastor uh, comes from the Greek word poimen, and it's the word Jesus used when he said, I am the good shepherd. It's the same word. It's just translated, well, it's not translated. It comes from the, I think it's from the Latin, and it just means shepherd. Pa that's what the word pastor means. The pastor is a shepherd. There's a joke that says that old preachers don't retire. They just go out to pastor. That's it. Um, now, today we often refer to the preacher as the pastor, but the New Testament uses the word to describe the role and function of the elders. Paul did in his talk with the elders from Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So the elders are the shepherds of a congregation. Congregation are the flock. Uh, the Apostle Peter wrote similarly in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. He said, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So the elders are referred to as shepherds, but Jesus is, as Peter said, the chief shepherd shepherd. And Jesus says he is a good shepherd. What makes Jesus a good shepherd? Well, it's been pointed out that to be a good shepherd, a shepherd must walk in front of the sheep, but he also needs to walk with the sheep and behind the sheep. And that sounds kind of puzzling and difficult, kind of like trying to be in three places at the same time. How can you walk in front of the sheep and yet be with them and behind them all at the, all at the same time? But I think it's a good description and just shows the difficulty of being a shepherd and how good a shepherd Jesus is. First, a shepherd walks out in front of his sheep. As I mentioned last week, shepherds don't drive their flock. They don't, they don't go behind pushing them like cattle, they go out in front of and lead the way. You know, they're, they're leading the sheep to a place that they don't know. They don't know where they're going. The shepherd is leading them to this place. And so he must be out in front. In a few chapters, in John chapter 14, Jesus tells the disciples about how he is going to heaven. He's going out ahead of them, he says, to prepare a place for them. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. 
And so Jesus is our good shepherd. He goes out before us. He's showing us the way. However, if the shepherd gets out too far, right? If he, he's out too far ahead of the, of the flock, he's not leading them. He's just going on a walk by himself. You can't leave them too far, can't lead too far ahead. A good shepherd also must walk with his sheep. Uh, Lynn Anderson, several years ago, wrote a book about church elders, and he titled it, uh, They Smell Like Sheep. <laughs> talking about the elders, they smell like sheep. Well, what does that mean? Well, he's talking about the need for the elders to be a part of the congregation's lives, the members' lives. And, and that was Jesus, wasn't he? Wasn't it? Jesus was a part of the lives of the people. He didn't, he didn't hold himself aloof from the people, right? Y'all are just not important enough, or I'm just too busy. Uh, Jesus was involved in their lives, and, and really that was the chief complaint made against him. Luke wrote, Luke chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus got down among the people to get to know the people. Later in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, they didn't complain, though, when Jesus ate with other Pharisees. <laughs> he, he ate with Pharisees as well. It wasn't that Jesus, he only ate with tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus walked out in front of the flock. He was also walking with his sheep. Third, Jesus walked behind the flock. You know, the shepherd has to pay attention, not to just the sheep right in the front. He's got to pay attention to the sheep that are at the end of the flock. You know, those who are going slower. Well, why are they going slower? Well, maybe they just got distracted. And so they need a little encouragement to catch up. Maybe Maybe the sheep is, is sick. Maybe so it needs help. But the sheep at the back of the fold, the flack of the flock, are susceptible, right, to wolves coming in. Because they're a little further behind. And so he has to watch out for the, all of those. Not, not just the ones in the front. He needs to pay attention to the entire flock. You know, Jesus is that shepherd who left the 90 and 9 to go out and find the one that was lost. Jesus reached out to those that society had just walked away from, overlooked. Like Matthew, he invited him to be a disciple. The woman at the well, or Zacchaeus. He was attentive to those who had fallen behind. And so Jesus walked in front of, he, he walked with and, and walked behind. Now, let's look at our text and see how Jesus describes himself as our, our good shepherd. And what we see is Jesus is a good shepherd because he's willing to lay down his life for us. You know, shepherds put themselves between their sheep and whatever would seek to harm them. Predators or, or thieves, they risk their own lives for their sheep. And Jesus says that's what he does. Verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And that's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. Jesus gave his life that we might have life. Now, it was the Jews who turned Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified. It was the Romans who who nailed him to the cross. Of course, it was also our sins that put him on the cross. But they didn't make him do it. Jesus willingly did it. Right? Jesus went to the cross of his own free will. He died 
for us. Of course, he didn't stay dead. Jesus raised from the dead. As Jesus said in verse 17, John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, he says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. And so Jesus is our good shepherd because he, he sacrificed his life for ours. Second, Jesus is a good shepherd because he is loving. You know, the reason he's willing to lay down his life is because of his love for us. John recorded Jesus as saying in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay one's down one's life for one's friends. And so Jesus didn't just say, I love you. Jesus demonstrated his love. And he demonstrated it by giving his life for us. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we sing about Jesus loving us, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But do we really understand just how great his love for us is? Do we really understand it and believe it? Because there are so many who have difficulty accepting it. Perhaps because it's not something that we have to earn or work for or deserve. It's just a free gift. God loves us. And so Jesus is our good shepherd who loves us. Third, Jesus is our good shepherd because he cares for us. Now, in this passage, Jesus compares himself, our good shepherd, with the hired hand. The good shepherd takes care of the sheep, lays down his life for the sheep. What does the hired hand do? Well, as long as it's easy, he's watching over the sheep. As long as the money's there, he's watching over the sheep. But at the first sign of danger, the hired hand is out, right? He's taking care of himself first, and he's, he's, uh, he's running away. It's the shepherd who loves the sheep and cares for their well-being. The hired hand runs. You know, imagine... Imagine a mother getting up in the middle of the night uh, because her child is crying and is sick. And she goes into the child's room and says, sorry, you're not feeling well, but you know, I clocked out at 12 o'clock. Uh, it's now your dad's turn. And so I'll go wake him. I hope you feel better by morning. And then walks out. You know, was that ever happen? No, no, that doesn't. That's not the way it works. Even in the middle of the night, you know, they will care for their uh, children. You know, there is no need that we have that is too large for Jesus to take care of. There's no need too small that he doesn't care about it. And there's no need that we have that he doesn't already know about. We just need to bring it to him. Because he cares. As Peter wrote in, in 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast all your anxiety, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Our good shepherd cares for us. And then fourth, Jesus is our good shepherd because he's personal. Look again at verse 14, at the end of verse 14. He says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus says he knows his sheep. He knows them by name. He knows each of us. And maybe he knows us better than we would like at times. You know, Jesus said even the hairs on our head are numbered. That's how well he knows us. You know, Jesus told Nathaniel when he met him, well, I saw you when you were, you know, reading under that fig tree. He saw him far off. But Jesus knew the thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees when they were questioning him about his ability to forgive sins. He knew their thoughts. And we're told that they knew, that Jesus knew the hearts of his opponents. Jesus knows us. 
But Jesus not only knows us, he wants us to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He desires a relationship. And so Jesus is our good shepherd. Of course, not everybody knows Jesus is a good shepherd. Not everybody knows him as their shepherd. Now, remember the context of this passage. John chapter 10 follows John chapter 9, right? Where Jesus heals the man who's been born blind. And the Pharisees are complaining because Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath. And so they're talking to each other. And then Jesus goes on and talks about being a shepherd. The gate and now the good shepherd. And so Jesus is talking to the Pharisees when he says these things. And when he finishes, how did the Pharisees respond? Verse 19. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? They thought Jesus was crazy. A shepherd, they just thought he was crazy. They just tuned him out. Of course, not everyone did. Verse 21. But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind. Isn't it funny? Uh, two different people seeing the exact same miracle, hearing the exact same words of Jesus, and coming to two complete opposite conclusions. They saw, they heard the same things. One said, oh, Jesus is crazy. And the other said, he must be from God. You think about the, the picture of Jesus as our good shepherd. Yeah, I look for some more pictures of, of Jesus. I found dozens. I've never done that before. There are, there are hundreds of pictures. It's a, it must be a popular subject. And I, it makes sense that it would be, right? That Jesus is our good shepherd. Now, as you look at those pictures, how do they make you feel? Do they give you comfort? Peace. <laughs> you know, knowing that Jesus is our gate, knowing that he is our good shepherd should give us peace. It should bring us comfort. You know, we have peace because we know who Jesus is. We know that he's with us, that he loves us, that he's laid down for his life for us and we'll, he will take care of us. On, uh, on Christmas Eve, 1875, Ira Sankey was traveling on, the Del on a uh, Delaware River steamboat. And uh, he was recognized by some of the passengers. His picture had been in a local newspaper because he was the song leader for the famous evangelist D.L. Moody. And so those who recognized him asked him if he would sing. He would sing them a hymn, and so he sang, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Right? We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. And the story goes that when Sankey finished, a man stepped out of the shadows and, and asked him, he said, did you ever serve in the Union Army? Yes, Mr. Sankey answered, in the spring of 1860. Can you remember if you were doing, doing picket duty on a bright moonlight night in, in 1962? Yes, Mr. Sankey answered, very much surprised. So did I, but I was serving in the Confederate Army. When I saw you standing at your post, I thought to myself, that fellow will never get away alive. I raised my musket and I took aim. I was standing in the shadow completely concealed while the full light of the moon was falling upon you. At that instant, just as, just as a moment ago, you raised your eyes to heaven and began to sing. I said to myself, let him sing his song to the end. I can shoot him when he's finished. But the song you sang then was the song you sang just now. I heard the words perfectly. We are thine. Do thou befriend us. 
be the guardian of our way. Those words stirred up many memories. I began to think of my childhood and my God-fearing mother. She had many times sung that song to me. You had, when you had finished your song, it was impossible for me to take aim again. I thought the Lord who is able to save that man from certain death must surely be great and mighty. And my arm of its own accord dropped limp to my side. Jesus is our good shepherd. He is always with us. He's in control. He provides. He's the guardian of our way. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for Jesus, our shepherd, who leads us, who cares for us, who loves us and gave his life for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.